On Tuesday, the 29th of September, President Mohamed Buhari wrote to the Senate asking it to approve the appointment of eight justices of the Supreme Court. In that letter, which was read out on the floor of the Senate, President Buhari said the request was pursuant to Section 231, Subsection 2 of the 1999 Constitution as amended and upon the advice of the National Judicial Council, NJC. The letter to the Senate is coming 11 months after the NJC first made its recommendation and after several commentators have expressed concern over the long delay in the appointment of the judges. This is just one of many issues I discussed with my guest, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Moise Banire. Here is our conversation. As we celebrate 60 years of Nigeria's independence, I want us to focus on the judiciary. How well would you say that the judiciary has fared 60 years after independence? Well, to the best of my knowledge, I think they've done wonderfully. Wonderfully. Uh, wonderfully within the constraint that they have, because a lot goes into it beyond what most people see outside there. So for me, they've really done well, although certainly they can be said to have been perfect along the line, but at least they've tried so far. When you say that they've, they've done well, what, what criteria are you using to judge? Well, in terms of basically what they are meant to do, particularly let me take the quantity. Now, in terms of the quantity of cases that they've been dealing with and they've been able to resolve, whichever way you feel about it, in terms of the quantity, if I call them uh, supermen, in that regard, for example, because they've done so much, you won't imagine how many, to just take the Supreme Court as an example and compare how many cases the Supreme Court all over the world does and how many they do in Nigeria, you will know that these people must certainly be magicians. Let's narrow down. Uh, to some of the constraints that are you know, facing our judiciary. And you've written a lot of articles about the need to save our judges. On Tuesday, September 29, the president finally sent the names of justices recommended for elevation to the Supreme Court after about 11 months that the first recommendation was made. But what, in your opinion, is the implication of this for the judges, the delay that we saw, what in your opinion is the implication of it for the, justi for the judges and the justice system, the judiciary generally in the country? Well, uh, you know that the, for the Supreme Court, we are expected to have uh, 21. 21 justices. Okay. Now, as I did last time, if my recollection is right, that's doing due to level. So quite naturally, you will see that there's no way they will be able to attend to so many urgent cases that are on. So a lot of commercial cases are suffering. Apart from other cases, I have only singled out the commercial cases because this is a country that will tend to want to attract investment into the nation. And I do not know where your judiciary is that challenge that any investor will bring money to your country. Because indirectly, it is an impairment of the rule of law itself. So for me, it is a lend to the speedy administration of just, uh, ju justice. Because what you now discover is that if, for example, within that 11 months that you alluded to, 60 cases ought to have been taken, the best they could have probably done would be about 20 to 25 cases. So all others, of course, will still be stuck there. So that is the implication for our justice system. And that means, in my very strong view, that once there is delay there, even if eventually people get, tend to be victorious in respect of their claim, the reality of the matter is that, for me, it has, uh, by implication, become injustice. Because the value of the so judgment is no more there in some instances. Mm -hmm. So that's one aspect of it. Again, is that we then will be overworking the justices themselves. Yes. To the extent that after retirement, most of them become useless to themselves. They become vegetable at times mm -hmm. and become a burden on their family and their children. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of evil that we perpetrate on the justices. So for me, is not a early development at all. This is something that must always be given priority. I want to talk about what we can do to prevent this kind of gap, this kind of delay that we've seen going forward. And I've had some very interesting suggestions which I, I want you to comment on. There are those who think that the NJC should be constitutionally empowered to solely make the appointments so that where there's delay, they will fill in the gap. Is there merit in, in such arguments, or that the judges would, ap would act in an acting capacity pending when the president does the need for? No, the latter is not it at all. Hmm. There's no way you can act in an acting capacity whether you're not appointed to do that job. That one is out of it completely. No, but they, they say maybe a constitutional amendment to make, put that in place. Well, for me, that is not attractive. It's not an attractive option at all. 
The other one is the one that I believe that you beat the situation. In fact, beyond what you have alluded to, let me tell you the reality is that if you say that the NGC is responsible for appointment, uh, promotion, and discipline of judges, and you still have to go to another shop to conclude or to finalize, then there's a problem in the system. And we have already seen the problem already. You know, there are some instances that, for example, the NGC will recommend a particular person for to become a judge, it goes to the executive, the executive will refuse or reject it. Like then there is that is in cross river and it also other say we've had it over time. Yes. And you now find a situation where except LDC backs down, the flexing of the will continue. Mm -hmm. For example, take the cross river say that you pointed out now. NDC's position is that we have not seen any reason to reconsider our position. So, and we see no reason why such person should not be appointed as the chief judge of that state. Mm -hmm. The same thing at that you have, for example, in River State, the governor, by extension, the executive, is pushing it on the legislature. Mm -hmm. That is, the legislation is not the executive. That's the kind of challenge we continue to have all over. So, for me, let's have a one-stop shop in the appointment of judges. The entity to take full responsibility from start to finish. Finish. Another suggestion that I have heard, and this one was put forward by Governor Nassil El Rufai of Kaduna State, people like that who believe that NJC is the one that delays appointments, and he recommends that the constitution should be reviewed to allow the Judicial Service Commission of the states to handle appointments in their states. Well, there is some measure of merit there to be candid, particularly for those who believe in physical federalism. Their position has always been that everything should be uh, decomposed in a manner that the center takes its own responsibility, the state takes it. In that way, there will be some measure of credibility in that argument to say that, okay, the process of appointment should start and end, particularly in respect of state judiciary with the state and not go up. But the danger there, it did not be practiced before. It's historical, there is historical evidence that it has been abused. But if that must be, then we must work out or develop checks and balances. For example, I will suggest, and I've been suggesting it, that even the composition of the State Judicial Service Commission is not balanced enough to ensure any neutrality in the appointment process. You have the Chief Judge, you have the Attorney General, and practically all other uh, people that we have within the State Judicial are appointees of the uh, governor. Mm -hmm. So what do you expect at the end of the day? It will be a crony, most likely. It's just a waste of time because at the end of the day, it's what is thrown in and they throw out. Mm -hmm. So what I will expect is a situation where we have independent agencies donating people into the state judicial service because in which event, eventually the chief judge will terminate the process. Mm -hmm. And like we are suggesting for the NJC, the, the appointment must now terminate at, at the state level. judiciary level, not at the executive, nor at the legislative level. I want to also talk about the issue of salaries of judges, and which is also something that you've written about. From my findings, the last time salaries of judges were increased was 12 years ago, 2008. 2008. Yes, but what effects do you think that this is having on the administration of justice in Nigeria? This, we are not increasing their salaries for 12 years. Well, it's a matter of destruction because if you are not careful, which I'm not too sure, again, that judges are not, again, doing some part-time <laughs> jobs again, like other, like teachers, <laughs> like even civil servants. Before you know it, some judges, a court might even be engaging in selling <laughs> five bricks all over, buying and selling along the line, and they get distracted. Mm -hmm. Some are even, which is true now, some are already partially in the academics, they are in the habit, if I can put it that way, of now delivering lectures all over the whole place, at least to get some little remuneration here and there. Because the salaries are poor. Because the salaries are terribly poor. So mm -hmm. they get distracted now mm -hmm. at the end of the day. That's the major challenge that you have. Mm -hmm. And the further implication, if you like, call it the multiplier effect of it, is that at the end of the day, equally, when they retire, they become a nuisance of the society. Mm -hmm. Because then they are so poor that they become ex executive beggars all over the place. Some of them, even who are detailed to even why we are not corrupt, are beginning to be able to, uh, to uh, are beginning to serve as intermediary between client and their contemporaries in the judiciary or even lawyers. Or some even like act as legal consultant because they have to make ends meet. These are some of the challenges of the, the implication of depriving them of what I consider to be their basic entitlement. Who, who has the responsibility for doing something about it? Well, you know, 
it has to be triggered, in my view, from what I've seen, it has to be triggered by the NJC to the appropriate body. And that brings us to a very interesting area that is a bit complex, uh, the area of the financial autonomy for the judiciary. Yes. Because if they have their autonomy, they'll be able to determine appropriately through that commission how much they are entitled to. Is it not a cause that lawyers can fight on behalf of the judges? In fact, it's our primary responsibility. That I can tell you, primary responsibility of the bar to fight. You know, judges are to be seen and not, not heard. Yes. And that is why they are being trampled upon and treated in this manner. Mm. But we in the bar need to wake up. Because at the end of the day, we are all suffering it. We are all suffering it. Mm. If a judge is not happy doing his job, at the end of the day, you will be a brunt of it. There's also this argument in some quarters, that the NJC is becoming too powerful and that sometimes it constitutes itself into a court by getting involved in matters that should be left for the courts to decide. Well, to the best of my knowledge, uh, MJC is not even powerful at all. It's a weakling. I would do respect to the members of the council, uh, which coincidentally I happen to be one, yeah, of, one them. of them. Yes. Uh, uh, I, I regard us as weakling. I'll give you a good example. We consider some appointees within the FCT judiciary for appointment and sent it wrongly or rightly to the president. The list came back, accepting only 11 out of the 31 without any reason. Given. Given. That is not the first time we've had several instances like that, that they will just reject some people who they won't even give you reason. You ask nobody will talk to you. Because the reason you possibly could give us might be even be enough reason, sufficient reason, why that person should not continue to serve as a judicial officer. But they just go But blank. because mm. you are not talking to us and we can't do anything, we seem powerless, mm. at the end of the day, the thing continues. Mm. So for me, NTC is not even powerful enough. They've not... Maybe they don't even know the, the extent, extent of their, of their power at times. There are so many things that I expect. For example, NJC must be able to guarantee and ensure that the infrastructure in the judiciary are at least at the barest minimum all over the country. In other words, state government must be forced to maintain minimum standards in terms of infrastructural support to the judiciary. NJC has not done that. How do they force them? Uh -uh. It's simple. You bring your appointment, we won't do it. We will tell you, go and put right all those things that are wrong with your judiciary board before we can consider any other thing for you. It's as simple as that. Yes, but because, because before, you, before that. you appoint, there must be structures there in place. There must be structure. But if you are telling us, we have new courts, but what of the old one? Have you maintained the old one? Have you made your judges comfortable? Do they have the right house? Do they have the right vehicles? In fact, recently in one state, which I will mention, the judges were even telling me they have only one card they gave me. I said, well, do they give commissioners one car? I, I serve as commissioners. Well, throughout the time I was commissioner, they usually give us two cars. Because one is expected to be the main car, one as a backup. Because if, for example, you give a judge a car and it thing goes for service or breaks down, what happens? It goes into commercial bus with the criminals, they, they accuse people. Mm. This is the embarrassment you will cause them. These are the minimum standards that NGC must insist that they must have this, they must have that. I've seen an instance which I alluded to, in which a judge was sick and partially at the point of death, and the executive declined to approve money for the treatment just simply because the judge had refused to be compromised in the matter involving the state government. Is that right? If they have their own fund, would they not sponsor themselves for their medical? So there are so many things that are wrong that needs to be corrected. If I if I must act powerfully, all these things, in my very strong view, they must insist on them as minimum standard.